Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, today and share a few thoughts um, why the AI Governance Clinic is important for Thailand. Now, of course, first let me explain a little bit what the AI Governance Clinic is. Uh, it's a project uh, by ETA and uh, I think it's a very exciting and important initiative. Um, you know, usually we think when we talk about innovation, we think about technical innovation, uh, new technologies, right? But increasingly, it's also important to think about innovation when it comes to governance and how we regulate or steer uh, cutting edge technologies like AI to make sure that they benefit all members of society uh, and that we can address risks and challenges. So the AI Governance Clinic by ETA is such an innovation, not in technology, but in governance. It's designed as an innovative capacity building, multi-stakeholder platform to enable collaborations across the private and public sectors. So bringing together civil society, government actors, industry, startups, technical communities and the like to really address some of the governance challenges of our time but also embrace opportunities that come with uh, new technologies, especially AI and different uh, uses of data. The innovative part of this clinic is twofold. It responds to two challenges that I will um, expand on a little bit uh, in the presentation today. The first challenge is the development of AI and all the innovation we see coming out of the labs and now entering the market is breathtaking. I will talk a little bit about generative AI and chat GPT. Some of you may have uh, played around with it. Uh, it's breathtaking. And it's accelerating the speed with which new applications are, you know, going mainstream. Um, things that were previously only used by a few experts or uh, in labs at universities or in big companies are now becoming uh, uh, available around the globe. Now, these new technologies are, of course, embedded in, in societal structures. Um, and they often come with risk. Um, we'll talk a bit more about it from, you know, security risk, questions of bias and fairness to oversight and transparency. There are a whole, a long list of challenges. But equally important, of course, uh, new technologies come also with promise, with opportunity for, you know, education, for instance, or for um, entrepreneurship. Um, and um, for access to justice and, and so forth. And the, the key challenge for governments in particular, but I would say for the ecosystem more generally, is what are the policies, what are the governance frameworks, and also what are the laws and regulations we should put in place to again manage these risks, but also support uh, the good uses, so to speak, of innovative technology. And so as the cycle of innovation on the technical side is accelerating, uh, governments and key stakeholders in governance are struggling to keep up with the pace of this technological development. And the AI Governance Clinic is a platform to uh, respond in much more agile ways to changes in technology and society than you know the traditional format of lawmaking and regulation that usually takes much longer. Um, so this is uh, the first um, challenge the clinic seeks to address. The second challenge that the clinic also wants to address is another problem, but a related one. If you look also at the global uh, developments, we have seen over the past few years many, many new frameworks being enacted in response to cutting edge technologies. So for instance, we have seen dozens, actually hundreds of AI ethics 
guidelines and principles being rolled out by companies, by governments, by international organizations, by standard setting organizations and the like. There are also many laws in the making globally to regulate either specific application areas of AI, be it you know, self-driving cars or AI in finance, whatever the application area may be, or even horizontal uh, legislation like in Europe, the AI Act, which is currently uh, in the making. Now, this, again, is just a sign of uh, the responses of society and key actors vis-a-vis -vis tech development. But it also brings another problem with it, and that is for companies in particular, but also for other stakeholders, including governments, that adopt AI in their businesses, in their operations to improve services, for instance, it's very hard to figure out how not only to keep up with these best practices and ethics guidelines and laws and so forth, but also how to translate these fairly abstract principles into practice. So to give an example, if a government agency decides to buy an AI tool, let's say to detect fraud in social welfare systems, or in tax, uh, in, in taxation. Well, what are the best practices in terms of procurement when making a choice from what different types of AI offerings to select from? So, in other words, the second challenge the AI Governance Clinic seeks to address is to bridge the gap between these numerous high-level principles that exist, but then you know, the question how to actually translate them into practice for different stakeholders that are struggling um, to do so. So these are the two uh, challenges. In other words, um, the governance clinic seeks to translate principles into practice and of course also help with the development uh, of, of frameworks and I will say a little bit more about it. Now, importantly, um, the clinic is envisioned as a network, as a collaborative effort. I mentioned it. It brings together multiple stakeholders. It works across public and private spheres. And uh, it's also a capacity where, like in a hospital clinic, so that's a little bit of an analogy, um, it, it is oriented towards actual cases. So um, the idea is that um, a network of experts, fellows, uh, staff members um, are working with clients, uh, you know, not patients, but that's where the analogy falls apart, but, but with entities, companies, organizations who are wondering, you know, what are best practices and what's a responsible way to introduce AI to their operations and offer some guidance, offer some help um, in this collaborative and iterative format. The initial thematic focus will be on three areas, on um, data and AI in health. And I know there was a session this morning already uh, talking about the use of AI in health, a very important and promising area. Second focus is on, on finance and uh, thirdly on government services. So that's the initial focus in, in terms of uh, thematic areas of the clinic. Now, uh, just a very quick look at the organizational structure of this clinic, which is actually in the making right now. So you see in the middle some sort of the core uh, team uh, consisting of a operational team, ADETA, so staff members, um, who are supported by a group of fellows. So we start small uh, with a small number of expert fellows from academia, but also uh, from other backgrounds, um, and then an international policy advisory panel, and I will introduce that in just a minute. Now, this is some sort of the core uh, node of the clinic, the core team, but then, uh, very importantly, uh, the clinic is networking and collaborating with international partners. I will share a few names on the next slide but also importantly, of course, with Thai local partners, 
again, from different sectors, from academia, but also from industry, civil society, and so forth. I already mentioned the targeted sectors, uh, which you see again on, on the slide here. Now, I mentioned uh, the goal is twofold. One is um, the clinic is attended almost as a laboratory, a lab, uh, to come up with new policy and governance approaches vis-a-vis -vis these fast cycles of tech innovation. And second, it is uh, capacity to help translate from abstract principles to concrete solutions, if you will. And therefore, you also see a list uh, of, of the outputs at the bottom of this slide. So it includes um, consultation services, uh, which is essentially, you know, clients working with experts in a shared trusted space, the clinic space, on concrete application questions, working towards best practices, working through uh, hard uh, uh, problems at times. Then uh, the second part or second type of output is, is reports and recommendations and frameworks, what's here called technical publications, so policy briefs, uh, white papers, but also recommendations. So there's um, work on the way in that category. And then overall, of course, also education, educational efforts, uh, what is called capacity building here. Um, I think we all agree that uh, it's really important increasingly that uh, leaders of companies in all sectors, not only in tech sector, um, as well as people in general, the public in general, um, gets a understanding what AI-based technologies are about, have some baseline understanding, uh, understandings of data and data governance issues. Uh, sometimes it's called 21st century skills, sometimes it's called digital literacy. So there's a whole lot of education that needs to happen and the clinic um, is committed to contribute to that mission through workshops, courses, seminars, online teaching programs and the like. So that's some sort of the rough structure and some of the outputs. Um, and you see on this slide, as I mentioned, already some of the initial partners. Now, very importantly, this is an open invitation to everyone uh, to actually join uh, the network that I described of the clinic. Here are a few initial partners. Uh, MOU has been signed with NECTEC, but also with the Department of Health Services Support and the Department of Medical um, uh, uh, Sciences uh, Services. And you see also a few of the initial academic partners, uh, agency partners uh, like DGA, uh, my own university, TUM, um, and many more, uh, including uh, very strong uh, local partners, uh, Thai universities and beyond. So I mentioned that part of the clinic is an international policy advisory panel which actually will meet for the first time uh, next this coming Monday. Uh, it's a, um, a fantastic group of people uh, uh, from different backgrounds, from different geographies, bringing together very different international expertise, but also local expertise to the clinic. So we have local experts, um, including Dr. Navanan and Dr. Ram, who bring health care and health informatics know-how as well as cybersecurity knowledge uh, to the clinic. We have uh, colleagues from Europe, um, for instance, experts on entrepreneurship and the business side of AI, like uh, um, Professor Fieseler. Uh, we have people who are very knowledgeable in governance services. We have some of the world-renowned experts uh, here, including Stefan Verhulst from the GovLab at New York University in the US. We have colleagues who are coming more from an educational side, uh, from a psychological perspective, educational science perspective, like Sandra Cortesi, Dr. Cortesi um, from Harvard University. We have um, colleagues who have a computer science background and big data background, like uh, Professor Bifet from uh, New Zealand and so forth. So it's a diverse group. And again, the idea is uh, not only to 
provide high-level advice to ETA, uh, but actually to work hands-on with the fellows and with the local stakeholders on developing governance solutions to actual governance uh, challenges. So the question was, why is such a clinic, such a capacity, probably a timely idea, and why does it matter? Why is it important? Now, I think the rise of generative AI, and particularly as an example, um, the case of ChatGPT is a, is a really good illustration. Who in the room has already used ChatGPT? I see a few hands up. So ChatGPT is a chatbot um, from OpenAI, which is a US uh, company backed by funding from, from Microsoft, and I know uh, the Thailand Microsoft CEO was, was here on stage as well. Uh, that was released actually in end of November and of last year, and has become the fastest growing uh, platform uh, in some ways uh, of a consumer application. Uh, within just five days, ChatGPT, as you see on this slide, attracted one million users. And this is breathtaking. If you compare it with some other applications in the tech space previously, where it's taken sometimes years or at least uh, several months, like in the case of Instagram, to get to one million users, and here you have now an AI tool, an amazingly powerful tool, uh, within five days accumulating a million users. Two months later, it's already 100 million users uh, across the globe using a platform released by a US company and now literally creating what we may think of as a, a, maybe the iPhone moment of, tele, of mobile telephony, right? Uh, the iPhone was a game changer, how we think about accessing the internet and interacting with the digital world and how you know, we interact with each other. It was kind of a real tipping point. And arguably, ChatGPT may be such a similar tipping point now, uh, not in the digital communication space, but actually in the AI space and how we um, create knowledge and interact um, with, with uh, 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 the wealth of information on the internet. Now, what I want to point out here is I use ChatGPT, as I said, as an illustration for the kinds of challenges I would argue we will see more and more uh, coming up over the next couple of years. And the challenge here that I just described to governance and policy makers and decision makers, but also society at large, is really the speed and scale of technological development. So why ChatGPT is a good example is you see how quickly a technology, an application, now gets adopted by millions of users around the world. And you see the scale at which this happens. This is not you know, a few hundred thousand users. This is hundreds of millions of users potentially within a very short time and across the globe. And that creates a challenge because our governance structures, regulations, laws are not um, designed to catch up with such fast innovation cycles. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the governance clinic is uh, one more agile and flexible lab that brings together different stakeholders to figure out what are some of the challenges but also opportunities of these rapidly released uh, innovations. Now speaking of opportunities and challenges, I um, asked ChatGPT this morning, and you see it here on, on your left, what are your opportunities and challenges? You smart AI tool. And the answers are pretty interesting. So I um, took a screenshot of the opportunities where ChatGPT answers, well, you know, ChatGPT offers 
personalized opportunities for personalized interactions and experiences. And we at TUM, uh, a colleague of mine, Professor Ankleida Kasnechi, teamed up with students. She has a computer science background. And it, within a week, created a tool that let teachers use ChatGPT to provide personalized assessments and recommendations how students can improve their writing. So essentially, you know, students often have to write essays in schools. The teacher would just mark it red where there are spelling or grammar mistakes, but sometimes students don't get much feedback. But now what Professor Kasnechi did with a team of TUM students is to use ChatGPT to give personalized recommendations once you scan uh, the student essay and upload it and ask ChatGPT, how can you improve your writing skills? So that's just an example of the types of powerful personalizations you can do at scale. You would have to have many teachers, right, uh, to do this personalized improvement at scale, and now you have technology that does it within seconds, uh, sometimes with really amazing outcomes. Accessibility is another opportunity that ChatGPT self identified. There's a big discussion now in law. I have a, originally a legal training uh, where ChatGPT and similar tools can be used to reduce the barriers of access to justice. So instead of hiring an expensive lawyer, which can be prohibitive, uh, people can now get free, some sort of quick initial assessments on legal questions. Now, as I will hasten to point out, uh, this of course also comes with challenges because um, ChatGPT and other tools have of course accuracy problems, so I wouldn't say it replaces lawyers, but it's definitely a game changer, and I think we don't know yet um, how uh, such transformations are going to play out in fields as critical as law, but there are many other examples too. So programming of software, great example too, where ChatGPT has enormous power for coding um, by being able to produce code um, and democratizing in, in interesting ways uh, the production of code. So these are just a few examples of the tremendous opportunities, but of course there are also many challenges. Um, generative AI, which will be a topic of the meeting of the first uh, session of the International Policy Advisory Panel that I mentioned, uh, can be used for all sorts of purposes, for good purposes, let's say in healthcare, for you know, um, the example I just gave uh, to get a sense of, of legal questions and the like. But there are also problems like deepfake. There are problems that these tools can be used to produce malware. So not only good code, but also code that is threatening and posing problems. We see, of course, the challenge of bias because um, these large language models, such as ChatGPT, are based on what they scrape from the internet, from the web. And as we know, the internet is not without bias, not without flaws. And so as these tools get so powerful, but the source of data may be a problem based on which the models are built, you know, we basically scale up and put on steroids uh, some of the biases and problems we see. There are interesting questions around copyright and so forth, um, but also issues around trustworthiness. So how can we ensure that the responses we get from ChatGPT, like the one you see here as a screenshot, are accurate? How, how do we measure even the levels of accuracy if we cannot some sort of understand what the algorithms and the models in the background are doing and where the information is coming from? So you see tremendous opportunities, but also equally tremendous challenges. And again, this is 
potentially a game-changing moment for governance. And the point here is, so I mentioned speed and scale, but the point here is also the scope and pervasiveness. So the tools we are expecting to come out of the labs, including generative AI and using the example of chat GPT, are general purpose tools. They can be used in education, in healthcare, in security, in businesses of all sorts, in government services. And that puts an additional challenge to the regulators and to those who develop policy and governance frameworks because you have simultaneously to address very different contextual uses um, by technology and that's a huge, huge challenge and our institutions are traditionally not set up with these sorts of very pervasive uh, um, use cases and if they are, it takes them a long, long time to work through it. Think about it. The internet was born you know, the lead up in the 70s, but became a thing in the 90s. Until today, we're still trying to figure out how we govern the internet. So it takes a long time. And the internet developed, compared to what I just showed you two slides ago with ChatGPT, actually at a considerable pace. But now we have huge changes within two months that affect all sectors and all areas of life. Now, how do, we, how do we cope with that as a society? How do we figure out what safeguards and what guardrails we need to put in place? So this scope and pervasiveness is a second problem that, Chat GP, um, sorry, that um, the AI governance clinic uh, seeks to address. Now, the last thing I want to highlight, again, using ChatGPT just as an example, for to some sort of structural challenges uh, I see for governance to come is complexity and uncertainty. So here is a quote on, this, on the screen um, from a blog post from yesterday that I would encourage you to check out. This is from OpenAI, that's the company behind ChatGPT. And in a very thoughtful blog post planning for artificial general intelligence and beyond, um, the team writes, well, although we cannot predict exactly what will happen, and just stay with this line. <laughs> so this is the leading company giving us tools as powerful as ChatGPT, and the opening sentence is, although we have no clue how this is going to play out, right? So that's kind of the uncertainty part I wanted to highlight here. So the technology developers don't know what's going to happen, and none of us is knowing what's going to happen, and yet the technologies are rolled out of the labs. And I think that's a uh, both exciting but also kind of scary uh, future we are headed towards. And a second quote just from the same blog post that also made me pause is, I underlined it there, in confronting these risks, we acknowledge that what seems right in theory often plays out more strangely than expected in practice. So again, you know, that suggests even if we do our best in the phase of development and design and testing of technologies, once they're out in the wild, we may be surprised. And again, so how do we adjust to this new reality here um, on the side of governments and other actors that care about and have an obligation uh, also to regulate technology. Now, I'm coming to an end, um, but just want to highlight again where we are in this process. So AI, the discussion about how to regulate AI and what ethics principles should be has identified over the past five years. But we're still, again, in the process of working through some of these hard questions. Europe is still negotiating the first comprehensive AI law. And other countries, including um, many countries in the majority world, in the global south, countries like Thailand, 
have enacted national AI plans, have enacted ethics frameworks, but are now also looking towards the need for regulation vis-a-vis um, -vis tools uh, like um, generative AI. But it takes time. And as I said, um, it's not only the time lag between tech development and policy, development and governance frameworks, it's also the need to iterate because we don't have all the answers at the outset to bring some sort of startup thinking to the world of governance by creating minimum viable governance solutions to some of these new problems. That's, uh, I think, the overall challenge ahead. How do we prepare ourselves? How do we create labs within government agencies such as ETA to bring together um, the wealth of networks and the expertise of all different players to address some of these challenges that I mentioned, of which, again, remember, we don't know how they will play out um, in real time. That's kind of the project, and I'm super excited uh, to be part of this project and help to build with all of you the AI Governance Clinic with a fantastic team uh, with the hope that we can not only manage the risks of these exciting new technologies, but importantly, unlock their benefits and 